Good morning. We, I think you should find some yellow cards somewhere near where you're seat, seated, um, hopefully. I'm going to ask that you fill those out. That's how we keep track of who's here. And also on the one side, there is an opportunity for you to write down some prayer requests, um, and we use those for prayer meeting. Every Wednesday evening at 6 o'clock, we gather downstairs for prayer. We invite you to come with us. This week is a special week because we're beginning uh, to, uh, we're going to be having our 24-hour prayer and fasting starting, and I believe we're going to have somebody talk to us about it this morning. I'm going to let you do that right now. I have 1.30 to 2 a.m., 3.30 to 4 p.m. on Wednesday, and 4.30 to 5 p.m. on Wednesday. Those three slots are open. I want to thank everyone who took uh, a time to pray, and pray hard, fast hard. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Amen. Thank you. And and there could be more than one person for each slot, so if you want to sign up and in a slot that has a name already, go right ahead. It's great. Um, also on March 7th at 7 p.m., we'll be having our ministry council meeting so that we do not uh, disturb folks who are praying in the sanctuary. Ministries council will meet downstairs in that long room next to the church office. So just be aware of that. Uh, the Pastor Parish Relations Committee will meet on Thursday, March 9th at 11 a.m., Just be aware of that time, 11 a.m. Daylight savings time begins next Sunday, March 12th. Remember to turn your clocks ahead. Okay, if you show up to church at the time you showed up today, you'll be late. Probably can join me. Okay. Uh, Daylight savings time, remember that. Men of Zion will meet then on that same Sunday, March 12th at 8 a.m., even though our bodies will think it's 7. The United Women of Faith will meet on Tuesday, March 21st at 7 p.m. We will be having our Bible study on Wednesday, March 28th at 7 p.m. I understand we have another announcement. Good morning. Good morning. I said I'm in full-blown Easter mode. They told me I even dressed appropriately this morning. (laughs) I'm working on our Easter extravaganza. I know a lot of you have already volunteered to help. If I didn't ask you and you would like to help, please see me. But I need some things. We're going to make sock bunnies. So I'm looking for socks. I can go out and buy socks, but especially those of you with kids, I bet you have that basket of odd socks. I remember when my kids were growing up. I don't know where they went, but there was always a basket. If you would like to buy some socks, that would be great. But I I didn't want to use money to go out and buy 60 socks. Mm -hmm. And I'm talking like like these, like crew length socks, not big tall knee socks. We're just going to put a cup of rice in them and use some rubber bands and make some bunnies. So I'm looking for socks. That back window back there is a great place to put them. I do not need any more toilet paper rolls. Thank you for all of you that saved those for us. We have plenty back there now. I do need about 20 more cardboard egg cartons. There's a stack of them back there. I had just mentioned to a few people that I was looking for those. We're going to make painted flowers out of them. Mm -hmm. So if you have those, again, that back window is a good place for them. As usual, candy. You know, we can't have an Easter egg party without candy individually wrapped candies. We always give the kids a little goodie bag full of candy when they leave. And I don't know, most of you are probably aware, instead of an egg hunt, several years ago it had rained the whole week Mm. up to the Easter egg hunt. And we really couldn't send the kids out in that muddy, messy yard to pick up Easter eggs. So we started doing something different. We put a bag of eggs or a basket of eggs at each station. The kids do all kinds of crafts and face painting, and they get to pick up eggs at every station. Mm -hmm. All those eggs are filled. They either have candy or 
the last couple of years we put quarters in them. I don't know, with inflation, I might have to start putting two quarters in them. <laughs> or it's a prize. So I need individual small candies to fill their bags and to put in the eggs. And one last thing, we need prizes. The, the fun part of doing the eggs like we're doing is if they get a prize egg, they can immediately go to the prize table and pick out their prize. They don't have to wait till the end when 20 kids are all crushed in and nobody really gets what they want. So I need prizes. And the only other thing I have is next Sunday, immediately after worship, I'm asking everyone that volunteered to help if they could just stay for just a few minutes. I'm gonna have all the crafts ready to hand out, at just everything every station will need, I'm going to hand it to each of you so that we're all organized and ready to go. If you have any, question, any questions, call me, yell at me, whatever. But keep in mind, I'll have um, Tina put this list of things we're looking for probably in the email this week and in the bulletin. I forgot to do it, and she wasn't in the office on Friday, so you didn't get the written list today. But it's kind of normal Easter things. Thank you. Thank you. Are there any other announcements that need to be mentioned? Yes, ma'am. In case you think it's too early to do that, time flies. It's not too early. Hmm? Yes. Or as my father used to say, times, or, times are fun when you're having flies. Okay. Are there any other announcements? Let's prepare our hearts and minds for worship as we listen to the opening voluntary. Thank you, Elaine. Would you stand for the call to worship? Words are printed on the screen before you. 
No one can enter the kingdom of God without being born of water and spirit. Everyone who believes in the Son of God may not perish but have eternal life. Let us worship God by singing number 117, O God, our help in ages past. Let us pray. You keep your eye upon us, O God. Like a shield, you protect us. You give us hope despite the disquiet within us. All creatures sing your praise. We, your people, lift up your name. Hear us as we worship and speak to us as we gather. For we seek to be filled with your spirit and made alive by your abiding love. Amen. Please be seated. Our psalm of the day is Psalm 121. I invite you to join with me. Psalm 121, the words are printed on the screen before you. I lift up my eyes to the hills. From where does my help come? He will not let your foot be moved. He who keeps you will not slumber. The Lord is your keeper. The Lord is your shade at your right hand. The sun shall not strike you by day, nor the moon by night. Oops. I read your part, didn't I? Well, I'm going to continue to read. The Lord will keep you from all evil. He will keep your life. Amen. Our act of praise has created me a clean heart. You may remain seated as we sing together.
1 through 17. John and the third chapter beginning at verse 1. Hear now the word of the Lord. Now there was a man of the Pharisees named Nicodemus, a member of the Jewish ruling council. He came to Jesus at night and said, Rabbi, we know you are a teacher who has come from God, for no one could perform the miraculous signs you were doing if God were not with him. In reply, Jesus declared, I tell you the truth, no one can see the kingdom of God unless he is born again. How can a man be born when he is old, Nicodemus asked. Surely he cannot enter a second time into his mother's womb to be born. Jesus answered, I tell you the truth, no one can enter the kingdom of God unless he is born of water and the Spirit. Flesh gives birth to flesh, but the Spirit gives birth to the Spirit. You should not be surprised at my saying you must be born again. The wind blows wherever it pleases. You hear its sound, but you cannot tell where it comes from or where it is going. So it is with everyone born of the Spirit. How can this be? Nicodemus asked. You are Israel's teacher, said Jesus, and you do not understand these things? I tell you the truth. We speak of what we know and we testify to what we have seen, but still you people do not accept our testimony. I have spoken to you of earthly things and you do not believe. How then will you believe if I speak of heavenly things? No one has ever gone into heaven except the one who came from heaven, the Son of Man. Just as Moses lifted up the snake in the desert, so the Son of Man must be lifted up, that everyone who believes in him may have eternal life. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only Son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish, but have eternal life. For God did not send his Son into the world to condemn the world, but to save the world through him. May God add a blessing to the reading of his word. Children's Choir. Jubilant praise, I will fail. 
And now let the words of my mouth and the meditations of all our hearts be acceptable in thy sight, O Lord, our strength and our redeemer. Amen. The hymn writer penned these words. This world is not my home, I'm just passing through. My treasures are laid up somewhere beyond the blue. The angels beckon me from heaven's open door, and I can't feel at home in this world anymore. They're all expecting me, that's one thing I know. My Savior pardoned me, and now I onward go. I know he'll take me through, though I am weak and poor, and I can't feel at home in this world anymore. Just up in glory land, we'll live eternally. The saints on every hand are shouting victory. Their song of sweetest praise drifts back from heaven's shore, and I can't feel at home in this world anymore. O oh Lord, you know I have no friend like you. If heaven's not my home, then Lord, what will I do? The angels beckon me from heaven's open door, and I can't feel at home in this world anymore. Ever heard that hymn before? It was part of my growing up experience. It, it became part of who we are as a family and became one of those hymns that really lifted us to spiritual heights. Yet this morning, I can't help but wonder, is that hymn truly presenting a right picture of who we are? Are Christians really just passing through this world? Are we simply travelers on our way somewhere else, somewhere beyond the blue? Are we looking for that pie in the sky where we'll be happy by and by? Is that truly what we are called to be as Christians? Now, don't get me wrong. I understand the theme of the hymn. I love this hymn. The author intended to present a comforting message during great suffering. Indeed, who wouldn't want to know that there's a better place as they stand at the bedside of a loved one who is dying? Who wouldn't want to know that the world standards are not the standard used in determining self-worth when they've lost their job or a significant other has just left them? Who wouldn't want to know that anger and hate do not have the last word. Truly, I understand the theme of this hymn, and I love it. Yet again, I can't help but wonder, does this hymn present a problem if we take its meaning too far? I mean, whenever I pass through a place, I may look at the scenery, I may even stop for a while and take of its benefits, but I'm not truly invested in that place. My interests and loves are, are somewhere else, and my, minds will, my mind will quickly go where my heart is. My friends, because of that, there is great potential for abuse. I think that if we begin to see this world as a place we are just passing through, huge problems come to light. There's the problem of creating an environment where whole groups of people can be ignored or worse. We're just passing through, after all. They don't really matter. That's especially true when they become our enemy or threaten our livelihood. We've seen it happen in our history. We see it happening now. When we see this place uh, as a place where we're simply passing through, we create a world where we don't care about the environment. Our security is somewhere else, namely heaven, so we can use up the resources here. We can become consumers who take and take and take. If my home is somewhere else, why worry about this place? I know that Jesus told us that while we are in the world, we are not to be of the world. The Apostle Paul wrote about groaning for our heavenly dwelling, that house not made with hands eternal in the heavens. Yet I don't think that those passages of Scripture were meant to inspire a desire to escape or to exploit. 
when Jesus instructed to be in the world but not of the world, he was warning against assimilation into the world's values. When Paul talked about groaning, he was pointing out that there was something wrong with creation, but he added more. He would write, whether we are at home on earth, away from God, or away from home and with God, we are constantly ambitious and strive earnestly to be pleasing to God. Therefore, the real issue is the kingdom of God and when that kingdom starts. Is the kingdom coming or is it now? Is the kingdom of God somewhere beyond the blue or is it all of creation? In other words, does it start for us when we die and as believers are ushered into heaven? Or is it something that begins when we're born? I'd like to suggest this morning that the kingdom of God begins when we're born, specifically when we are born again. Jesus said, I assure you, unless you are born again, you can never see the kingdom of God. The truth is no one can enter the kingdom of God without being born of water and the Spirit. Humans can reproduce only human life, but the Holy Spirit gives new life from heaven. Are we just passing through? Absolutely not. Yeah, it's true that we're going to someday die. It's also true that there is great comfort and assurance in knowing that suffering and death will not defeat us. It's comforting that while the recent and past economic situation have shown that our treasures are not here, but somewhere else, we are in the kingdom of God now and that changes everything we're not simply taking in the scenes as we travel to another place we're not trying to milk the environment for all she has because what matters is somewhere else even other people cease to be means to an end and become rather fellow travelers on the journey indeed our focus is the kingdom now we live to share the good news that god's reign is today for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son not the world to come but the world now God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son so that everyone who believes in him would not perish but have eternal life God didn't send the son into the world to condemn the world but that the world might be saved through him today's world salvation is not for some place in the sky where we'll be happy by and by salvation is for the present and eternity this changes how we view our fellow human beings we have been called by God to announce the reign of God to a world that that is lost in sin we can do that because we know who we are and who we were We know the tremendous sacrifice given to make us who we are. We know further that if that transformation can happen in our hearts, it can happen in any heart. So instead of seeing our neighbor as an enemy, instead of zoning in on the offense, we can see our neighbor as someone with divine worth because they are someone for whom Jesus died. This changes how we live. Personal and social sin results in the accumulation of wealth on the one hand and the neglect of our fellow human beings on the other. Jesus said, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me because He has anointed me to bring good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim release to the captives and recovering of sight to the blind, to let the oppressed go free, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. My friends, to proclaim that it was the year of the Lord's favor was to proclaim that jubilee had come jubilee was and is that time when debt was canceled and slaves and captives were set free if we see this present age as the kingdom of god then we by definition live to proclaim jubilee we live to proclaim redemption from sin Not that we do the redeeming, but we lift up the one who does. 
This changes the way I pray. I don't rejoice anymore when I begin to think that the end is near. I, I believe wholeheartedly that we are in the end times, but I don't rejoice over that. In fact, I lament that. And I've said this to you before, I know. I lament it because I have friends and family who have never surrendered their life to Jesus. And if Jesus returns before they surrendered their life, then they are lost. And that is not acceptable to me. And so I pray for their salvation. The Apostle Peter wrote in 2 Peter 3, 9, The Lord is not slow about His promise, as some think of slowness, but is patient with you, not wanting any to perish, but all to come to repentance. Therefore I pray, sisters and brothers, Thy kingdom come, not because I want to get to heaven quick, but that the Lord would, be re that, that the Lord would quickly renew the world. Indeed, this changes everything. Now, does this mean that we're in heaven now? Again, no, it doesn't. We still find ourselves in this world with all its problems and all of its sin, indeed all of our sin. This world in which we live is still broken and scarred by that sin. Yet as believers, as those whose faith has led us to the saving grace of God, we know that God, even now, continues to work for the healing of this world. And he has called us to join him in that work. I know that's a daunting task and it can be scary. So I want to tell you this story from my youth. When I was just little, I think I was in kindergarten, second grade, the second, kindergarten and first grade, we lived in Kansas City, Missouri. And we lived on this city block and, uh, you know, kindergarten, first grade, that age when you learn how to ride a two-wheeler bike. Right? Yeah. Well, my dad, being from the generation that he was from, did not believe. I'm telling you, if you put training wheels on your bike, you were going to go straight to hell. You do not put training wheels on a bicycle, according to my dad. Thankfully, I grew up, didn't say that to my kids. But anyways... So, how did I learn how to ride a bicycle? Well, my dad would put me on the bicycle and then hold on and run behind me and say, okay, pedal, pedal, pedal. And all the while I'd say, dad, don't let go, don't let go, don't let go. Well, we would do this around that block and just before we'd make the last turn to come home, there was this driveway, not real long, about 10, 15 feet, but it was steep, and, I, and it, I'm telling you, as a little kid, it looked like it was a cliff that went straight down into a garage door. Well, Dad, in his infinite wisdom, let go of the bike right there. And guess what? Bang! Right into that garage door. And I'm crying, you know. I'm thinking I'm dead. But did Dad leave me there? To his credit, he did not. Dad was a good dad. Dad came down, picked me up, brushed my knees off, picked up my bicycle, took me back up to the sidewalk, put me back on the bike even though I didn't want to, and off we went. And it wouldn't be long until I was able to ride by myself. The church exists to be a picture of what it, what it means to be in the kingdom and we're learning to be that picture we're not always good at it we stumble often but God in God's grace does not leave us alone our heavenly dad figuratively speaking comes down to the garage door brushes off our knees carries us back to the path so we can start over again this world is not my home is still a wonderful old hymn of the church, and I love it. I love the message it gives, the struggles we face, the things that make us cry do not have to defeat us. 
And yet, it's very good to know that while I may not be rich here, I do have treasures somewhere beyond the blue. Yet I will be careful not to take that message too far and to forget that I'm in the kingdom of, of God now. Indeed, John Stott once wrote, we should not ask what is wrong with the world, for that diagnosis has already been given. Rather, we should ask what has happened to the salt and light. In other words, sisters and brothers, we should be asking what has happened to the church that is supposed to show the world what creation was intended to be. We're not just passing through on our way to somewhere else. We have been given the wonderful task of bringing flavor to a tasteless world. We have been called to illuminate the cross of Christ, to lift Jesus up, because we know that if he is lifted up, he will draw the whole world to himself. May we be careful to ask God to examine our attitudes about this world. May we be careful to ask God to remind us that indeed, God so loved the world, the world now, that he gave his only begotten son, so that everyone who believes in him will not perish, but have everlasting life. God did not send his son into the world to condemn it, but to save it. And he has invited all his disciples to join him in the task. Amen and amen. Our hymn is 369. Would you stand as we sing together, Blessed Assurance. The words are on the screen before us. Number 369. Let us affirm our faith together. I believe in God the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day he rose again. He ascended into heaven, is seated at the right hand of the Father, and will come again to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Please be seated.
we continue with our Holy Communion liturgy. Christ our Lord invites to his table all who love him, who earnestly repent of their sin, and seek to live in peace with one another. Therefore, let us confess our sin before God and one another. Let us pray together. Merciful God, we confess that we have not loved you with our whole heart. We have failed to be an obedient church. We have not done your will. We have broken your law. We have rebelled against your love. We have not loved our neighbors, and we have not heard the cry of the needy. Forgive us, we pray. Free us for joyful obedience. Through Jesus Christ our Lord, amen. Hear the good news. Christ died for us while we were yet sinners. That proves God's love toward us. In the name of Jesus Christ, you are forgiven. In the name of Jesus Christ, you are forgiven. Glory to God, amen. As forgiven and reconciled people of God, let us offer ourselves and our gifts to God as the ushers come forward. Would you stand as we sing together? Surely the presence of the Lord is in this place. Yes, your presence is here. We can feel it. And your presence is here because you have provided us with special gifts of the young people. Oh, so many. The future, the generations to come. Let it be that we can be leaders and they too follow in our path that they can create a better tomorrow and that these gifts and tithes and offerings be offered and use wisely in your son's name. Amen. For you. The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right and a good and joyful thing, always and everywhere, to give thanks to you, Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. You formed us in your image and breathed into us the breath of life. When we turned away and our love failed, your love remained steadfast. You delivered us from captivity, made covenant to be our sovereign God, and spoke to us through the prophets. And so with your people on earth and all the company of heaven, we praise your name and join their unending hymn. 
Holy, holy, holy Lord. God of power and might. Heaven and earth are full of your glory. Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. Holy are you and blessed is your Son, Jesus Christ. Your Spirit anointed him to preach good news to the poor, to proclaim release to the captives and recovering of sight to the blind, to set at liberty those who are oppressed, to announce that the time had come when you would save your people. He healed the sick, fed the hungry, and ate with sinners. By the baptism of his suffering, death, and resurrection, you gave birth to your church, delivered us from slavery to sin and death, and made with us a new covenant by water and the Spirit. When the Lord Jesus ascended, he promised to be with us always in the power of your word and Holy Spirit. On the night in which he gave himself up for us, he took bread, gave thanks to you, broke the bread, gave it to his disciples and said, Take, eat, this is my body which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. When the supper was over, he took the cup, gave thanks to you, gave it to his disciples and said, Drink from this, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant, poured out for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. And so in remembrance of these, your mighty acts in Jesus Christ, we offer ourselves in praise and thanksgiving as a holy and living sacrifice in union with Christ offering for us as we proclaim the mystery of faith. Christ has died. Christ is, Christ is risen, Christ will come again. Pour out your Holy Spirit on us gathered here and on these gifts of bread and juice. Make them be for us the body and blood of Christ, that we may be for the world the body of Christ redeemed by his blood. By your Spirit, make us one with Christ, one with each other, and one in ministry to all the world until Christ comes in final victory and we feast at his heavenly banquet. Through your Son, Jesus Christ, with the Holy Spirit in your holy church, all honor and glory is yours, Almighty Father, now and forever. Amen, amen. Amen. The body of Christ broken for you. The blood of Christ shed for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. table is open for anyone who wishes to partake. And the ushers are going to come and they're going to pass the bread and the juice to you. Um, take a piece of the bread, hold it until I instruct you to eat it. Afterwards, you'll take a cup and drink it when I tell you to. Um, you're not required to do this. I'm not 
forcing you to do anything. If you don't want to, that's fine. Just let it go by. But we pray that you will experience the grace of God through this meal. And that we pray that you also would understand that it's open to everybody. Nobody, uh, regardless of how old or young you are, regardless of whether you're a member or not, no one is excluded. Would the ushers come? body of Christ broken for you take eat in remembrance of Jesus
the blood of Christ poured out for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Drink all of you in remembrance of Jesus. Let us pray. Eternal God, we give you thanks for this holy mystery in which you have given yourself to us. May it enlighten us to the truth. Grant that we may go into the world in the strength of your spirit to give ourselves for others in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Our sending hymn is number 389. 389, would you stand as we sing together? Freely, freely, the words are also on the screen before you. Our benediction comes from 1 Corinthians chapter 15. Therefore, my beloved brothers and sisters, be steadfast, immovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, knowing that in the Lord your labor is not in vain. Amen and amen.